This then analyzed the how, pattern analysis, yielding uh, knowledge about the pattern of what, when, and where, the pattern of distributions, the other kinds of patterns. And then, how did those patterns arise? The process interpretation. Again, all of this encompassing theory. Finally, once you understand the how and the why, and doing forecasting, you can start informing policy and public action, which in turn will tell you, well, we may need to, we might, we might need more of the what, when, and where to um, uh, enhance our results, to bring them to a finer resolution. How do we do this? Our principal at the Biodiversity Institute is that, and you've seen this before for GBIF, um, we have a blue chip activities, we have high growth activities, and we have risk venture activities. And in an institution, if you're starting a biodiversity institution, you must be willing to invest in all three at the same time. Notice how the arrows go. What is risk venture becomes high growth if it's successful. And what is high growth eventually becomes blue chip. We use the niche approach. We can't do everything. We do the things that are most appropriate to us and we invest in them. And we invest in them because we want to be the best in them. We want to lead, not follow. That's why you do risk venture. Because you want to lead. If you're successful in taking a risk, you will lead in that, like we led in biodiversity informatics. You don't want to just follow. Let others follow you. Finally, we use the mantra of ideas, people, and tools. Invest first in the best ideas. What are the best ideas? Invest then in the people to carry out those ideas, to implement them, and invest in the tools that allow the people to carry out the ideas. It's a very simple mantra, and it should inform all priority setting and all strategic planning. How do we do this? We do biodiversity. We do evolutionary pattern and process. We do ecological pattern and process. And the way we unite them all is through cyber infrastructure and informatics. And you will do likewise in your biodiversity informatics institutions. It is informatics that is the medium that unites these three into a forecasting regime. How do we do it? We do it through research synergy. We have partnerships within the university. All of our faculty, 26 of our faculty are jointly appointed in uh, ecology and evolutionary biology, the university department, or in the Kansas Biological Survey, and here we are here. But we all are working as collaborators. We have 65 students in residence uh, working in our collections, and they have different mentors and different advisors throughout EEB and the KBS as well as the rest of the university. How do we pay for this? Well, 95% of our, I'm talking about our state budget, the budget we get from the state of Kansas through the university. 95% of the budget they give us pays for 
graduate education, one of our missions, and research, our second mission. In other words, the teaching of graduate students and their training and research, 95%. Only 5% of the money they give us goes to uh, the public side, the public museum of displays and informal science education. Although we get 75,000 visitors a year and um, about 15,000 students from kindergarten to grade 12, all taken care of by three staff. A terrible situation. Many other museums in the United States have much, much larger, much, much larger museums, certainly in comparison to their research organization. But we are at a university, and this is how the budget is allocated. That said, these two circles combined only account for 23% of what we do. The state only funds 23% of the activities at the University of Kansas. The rest, 77%, has to be raised from other sources. Private sources, uh, generous friends of the museum, uh, and generous friends of the university that, uh, that give us endowment funds, and grants and contracts from governments and, and, and industry. Let's look at grants. Most of our grants, 90% of our grants, comes from the National Science Foundation. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? We are way too dependent on one funding source. This is like a town that's way too dependent on one industry for its total economy. We have to diversify. It's very hard. It's very hard in the U.S. funding scheme, all of these, all of these different agencies, to diversify in biodiversity. But we're getting better at it. So there's the other principle. In your funding, don't depend on one funding source, your university or your government. Diversify, diversify from the get-go as much as you can. So if one has a bad year and can't fund you, you can still get bridge funds and carry on with other people. It's like a stock portfolio. Diversification. How do we pay for it? We have 40 grants at this point in time from the National Science Foundation and just one or two from all of, or three of all of these other agencies. That's a terrible picture. It's great. We're very good at writing grants for the National Science Foundation. But if the National Science Foundation gets a big cut, we're screwed. Can you say screwed on YouTube? You just did. I guess I just did. <laughs> okay. You're all going to know this, but quickly I can go through the typical costs that you can anticipate in setting up a biodiversity informatics institution. Facilities cost, new buildings, climate control, processing specimens, studying and laboratory facilities, security and access, in equipment, cases, drawers, supplies, cryogenic facilities if you're going to have tissues, which you must have. Um, IT technology, uh, uh, informatics technology, certainly personnel, scientists, technicians, collections, and IT specialists, students, and so forth. What are the hurdles you will face in academia? Jean told me he's, he's in academia. What hurdles will he face? I don't know the culture of his academic situation, but if it's anything like the academic situation in the United States, here's the hur some of the hurdles he will face. Biodiversity informatics in academia. Looks like this. It's all over the place. 
Why do I say that? Because from the get-go, as we have all been talking about, biodiversity informatics requires research that is integrative, collaborative, with partnership, integrative, and it making description into prediction. It requires the collaboration of many, many different disciplines. That means many different people, each one an expert in his or her discipline. If you want to go from data to analysis to modeling to narrative in this, this framework, you use biodiversity, paleobiology, ecology and ecosystems, hydro and geosphere systems, genomics, climate, computational science, web architectures, mathematics, software programming, GIS systems, visualization, all the human systems, economics and political science and social science and so forth. And the list goes on. All of these go into informatics to making predictions that then can turn into policy. This is what we would need. But what actually happens in universities? Research is solitary and isolated. Research is siloed. In most of academia, not all, but in most of academia, departments and researchers and their faculty live in silos. The department is a silo, then every program in the department is a silo, and often every individual in the department is a silo. Why is this so hard in academia? Why is this so hard? We're among the most educated people on earth and among the most siloed. Why is this so hard? Well, you just have to tell the truth. Personality. What's the solution? Hire the right people. Hire the people that you can tell through interviews and their previous work will collaborate and not jump immediately into their own silo. Why is this so hard? Why is integration and collaboration so hard? Because for most academics, it's one it, what's in it for me? Ego, selfishness. What's, what's the solution? I can say this on YouTube. Observe the no asshole rule. Matter of fact, read the book, The No Asshole Rule, published by a business professor at Stanford University. What's the principle? There are many Nobel Prize winners out there we can hire. Some of them are not assholes. Hire the ones that aren't. They will get along. Assholes destroy departments. They're not collaborative. They won't work for the common good. There are a lot of great researchers out there that are terrific collaborators and have that vision of collaboration and integration to solve bigger problems. Why is this so hard in academia? Well, you know, it means change. Look at academia. We wear robes, we have tenure. Is there another institution on earth that this reminds you of? That doesn't change very much? Somebody, I just heard somebody whisper it. I can say it on YouTube, the church. Why is this so hard? Academic tribalism. We erect our own disciplinary silos, inherited from the British model of 12th century universities or the German model of the 16th century or 17th century universities. We're not taught how to collaborate. We're trained to be completely isolated. We're told as students, don't collaborate, someone will steal your data. Publish a paper alone, it'll count for more than if you publish with somebody else. 
right? What ridiculous bullshit. We like it. Academics like it. It's the system that hired us. It educated us. It graduated us. Now it employs us and pays us. Why would we want to change it? We are the last of the medieval guilds. We're the last holdout of central planning. And we know how successful central planning is. Okay, what are the specific hurdles to informatics and digitization and, and uh, biodiversity issues? Here's what you will hear from curators. Here's what you will hear from scientists. Here's what we have heard from our own folks. And here's what we still hear from curators around museums in the United States. The identifications are wrong. We can't put them up there. Of course, it doesn't matter that half the time papers are published, the identifications are wrong. And they're, if they're wrong, and if you put them out there, they'll be corrected. But no, we can't put them out there. The occurrence data is wrong. We can't put it out there. Well, if you put it out there and somebody maps it and, found, and finds that the data for a rodent is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it'll get corrected. The best way to correct the data, the best way to georeference, is to map it and see where the errors are. Let's start with mapping it. Map your data. And I will, we'll sh be showing you that on Friday on some of the GBIF records that are incorrectly coded. It's not GBIF's fault, it's the data that they get. Third excuse, if I put it out there, people will steal my research. Town told me of an example of a curator at a museum who agreed finally to put all the data from that division online. I think it was bird data, but only bird data that had been collected from, I mean, birds that had been collected prior to anybody alive being at that museum. Because, other, because even though it was 15, 20 years ago, somebody, it's still a research project that's ongoing and somebody might steal it. Chris, please be discreet and don't say the Smithsonian Institution, okay? Okay. <laughs> Others will say, it's my data, damn it, and no one else is going to have it, as if they own it. Really? The taxpayer paid for it. And the taxpayer paid for it so that it will ultimately inform wise policy for that country and for that person. In that sense, it's as treasonous as giving away state secrets. People will steal our data and misuse it. They'll use it for the wrong reasons. Okay? So? Data is always being used for the wrong reasons. Conservatives interpret data one way for their reasons, and liberals interpret data their way for their reasons. That's what statistics is. Fiction in its most uninteresting form. People will steal our data and make a profit on it. This is a common complaint. The NGOs will take, our, will take say, data from GBIF or data uh, served individually, and they'll publish books on it and they'll make money. Well, my response to that is, why don't you do it? Why doesn't your institution do it? You can publish a book based on your data. It may even be better than the data that, that GIFA puts out. Once the data is captured, administrators will throw out of the collections. Never happened. It's never happened. Show me the evidence. I want to have no one case where a collection has been digitized and the collection has then been thrown out. On the contrary, the collections then have more use than they've ever had before because, hey, people know about it. This is like, you want to sell a house, but I'm not going to list it. How does anybody know it's for sale? How does anybody know your collection has this, that, or the other data worth working on? Once the data is captured, no one will want to use the collections. It's just the opposite. Every single collection that's been, that's been digitized and advertised has experienced more use than ever before because people know it's available. 